next speaker is uh, the Associate Administrator for the Science Mission Director at NASA Headquarters, a former astronaut. Uh, I followed him closely on uh, the Hubble Space Telescope, uh, last service mission, SM, SM4, uh, STS-125 flight. Uh, he has uh, been to Hubble several times. Let me introduce to you, John Grossman. Oh, wait, I got to finish my shoe. We will watch you for five minutes. Right. <laughs> okay, so I'm Cy Astro. <laughs> I gotta learn to type faster. No, you're making us feel better. <laughs> I'm hoping there's an AGU tag. AGU, hashtag AGU12. 12? Yeah. AGU12. Excellent, thank you. I knew this would be successful. Alright, oh, I should take a picture of the <laughs> Can I get it back? How many RTs well, can we get first, you? Uh, <laughs> this is my first American Geophysical Union meeting. I'm a member. Uh, last year, Drew Feustel was here. I don't know, was anybody here last year? Did you go to Drew's talk? I don't think no, so. He's my spacewalking partner. Okay. Know. In fact, we were just commenting over here that uh, one of the uh, press releases that just went out was about uh, NASA satellite observations of wildfires, not only in the U.S., but around the world. And one of the things you notice flying over the Earth wherever you look is wildfires. And you know why? One, because there's a lot of them. Two, because when you're on the shadow side of the earth and you look down, they're really obvious. And you actually see big flames. During the daytime, you see plumes of smoke you know, halfway around the world. So that was something I, I was interested in. But you know, the fun thing about my job is that you know, I get to see everything. And when I say everything, I really mean everything. Because uh, the science mission director at NASA, you know, we do a lot of earth science. Earth science, as Michael Freilich, the director of our Earth Science Program, says, is not only really interesting and challenging, but it's also important. Uh, and so, <laughs> so at the AGU, you know, we've seen talks about wildfires and its effect on climate and how it's not only uh, affecting climate because you're releasing a lot of carbon dioxide and greenhouse gases into the atmosphere um, and reducing the biomass, the stored carbon, uh, but also then the warming of the Earth increases the fire risk by drier atmosphere and uh, the effects of lightning strikes and things like that. So it's one of the positive feedbacks, uh, positive in the numerical sense. Um, so that's something that uh, is interesting to me. So we do earth science and we do solid earth, we do atmosphere. Uh, and then earlier today we heard the chorus uh, of the uh, electron surfing waves in the magnetosphere. And that's also really cool. Um, you know, we fly you know, astronauts 365 seven through uh, the magnetosphere and through these uh, choruses of electrons and things. Uh, and the radiation belt storm probes, now called the Van Allen probes, are for the first time getting both the spatial and time history of uh, the Van Allen belts as it flies around. And that, that mission is uh, you know, it's, you know, just its infancy, uh, so that's very exciting results. So we study you know, the near Earth environment, of course, heliophysics, another part of the American Geophysical Union meeting, uh, studying the sun. And in the case of the sun, again, it's not only challenging and interesting, but very important. And coming up, we'll just add solar maps. And so the sun is participating well with all of our missions. And if you look at the Solar Dynamics Observatory, and in fact, there's a great app. This is National Social. I hope you all have this. So I'm going to take a quick poll. Who has NASA space weather on their phone? It's SWX. So if we want to see on their smartphone, it doesn't have to be this type. So this is an image of the sun, and it's probably only a few hours old from Solar Dynamics Observatory. We can't see that far. <laughs> you can see it in, uh, well, it's still loading all the images. You can see it in various wavelengths, uh, and also from SOHO, a bigger view of chronographs, all kinds of neat things. So the sun is pretty active uh, right now, and once it loads up some more. You guys must be tweeting a lot because the bandwidth is. Uh, <laughs> it's only All those people are it's, it's 3G, what can I say? <laughs> and, uh, the sun. And then, of course, we do solar uh, system physics and, and the Mars results here, which is fantastic. I hope you were all at the Curiosity session. Personally, I think the remarks that were made by John Gratzinger and the rest of the team were earth shaking. Why? Because we landed this amazing rover. You know, <laughs> tens of millions of miles away with this crazy sky crane, you know, supersonic parachute landing system, and all the instruments work. I think just that we had done that uh, qualifies as ear shaking. 
and the science results are you know, really strong, considering we've been digging in the most boring place we can find deliberately. So I think that's all of that tertiary. There was a moment in Pasadena on August 5th when the telemetry came that Curiosity was wheels down and landing. And you, you've seen the chairs and all of that. But there was about 700 milliseconds prior to that where I looked around the room and I saw nothing but disbelief. You know, the people who had built Curiosity, the people who had spent their you know, last decade getting this ready to land, it was sort of the, I can't believe it really worked, look on their faces. And then they broke into the cheers and hugs and tears and laughter and all of that and backslap. Uh, so to me, that's really shaking. And so we have an amazing presence at Mars. As we speak, there's a session on uh, results from opportunity going on. And so that's all my remarks. I'm going to leave to find out what's no. <laughs> so, so anyway, so we're, you know, I'll have to get a, uh, a report from somebody in there. But you know, Opportunity is still doing great discoveries roving around Mars. And the Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter, Sir Odyssey, and, and Mars Express, you know, very exciting. ESA is building their ExoMars program, so I'm, I'm very excited about all of that. And then, of course, there's astrophysics, which is the rest of the universe. So when I say we get to do it all, uh, as a science, uh, it's really true, it's very exciting. So I think that's all the remarks I'll make, other than you can hear I have a little bit of a head cold. So uh, sorry about that. Any questions? How do you uh, balance like the missions that scientists really want versus ones that, you know, there's maybe a lot of either political or public, um, you know, would, would be really interested in that kind of thing? So the, uh, the question is how do you manage kind of the strategic and competitive sides? Uh, and that's a really good question. Um, so, first of all, you know, all of the science is, you know, people science. Um, you know, NASA is the enabler, and we have NASA centers that build missions, and we have scientists at NASA centers. But in the end, you know, the data goes to the scientist. All of our results go out to the public. You know, sometimes there's a uh, withholding period, you know, where scientists have worked, you know, their whole lives to get something, and we say, okay, well, you have six months or a year to analyze the results, and then it goes out to the but because it's the taxpayers that fund all of the NASA research, um, all, of, all of our uh, data goes out to the public in archives, in, in uh, data systems. And we get our inputs uh, largely from uh, the scientific community through a series of decadal surveys, advisory groups, uh, things like the uh, program analysis groups. We peg is the Mars Exploration Program Analysis Group. And so we, you know, our job is to synthesize all of that and then work with Congress and the administration, you know, to find you know, where that sweet spot is. Uh, and so, it, you know, it's a balance. I think often, uh, you know, the public's interest is kind of given short shrift, um, but it's, I think we, we would ignore that at our peril. And so I think, you know, for, uh, for the Curiosity landing, I mean, let's face it, Curiosity landing on Mars was an engineering event, not a science event. But we had 50 million people watching. And you might say, well, you know, that's the internet, right? That's, you know, that's Ustream and that's uh, social networking that allowed 50 million people to watch. But, you know, it was at, you know, midnight, 1 a.m. You know, people are inherently <laughs> lazy, right? Uh, I know I am. You know, if it's, uh, you know, 3 o'clock on a Sunday afternoon, you know, between football games or between, you know, periods, yeah, anybody can log onto the internet for five minutes to watch some event, right, that might be exciting. But to have... You know, thousands of people in Times Square in New York at, at 1 a.m. celebrating a science event. I think that's significant and uh, something we certainly pay attention to. Yes? Do you think the balance within NASA between science and human spaceflight and technology development is the appropriate balance, or do you think one side gets more than other at the deficit of another? Now this is a really, so the question is, you know, the balance between science, human spaceflight, and technology development. Um, you know, the purpose of the technology development is to queue up technology that human spaceflight or science will want to use, or, or other players. Um, and so, you know, that's something to, to that's a very difficult thing to, to change the gain on and know that you're at the right place. Um, so that's a little bit of an experiment we're doing. You know, beforehand, we had our technology development embedded in those organizations, and the organizations would you know, 
fund those things that they definitely had a pull for. Um, and so now we're trying a little bit of push and pull. And so that, that's an experiment. To me, even within science, but also, also within human spaceflight, all of the NASA portfolio, um, I see these, these artificial divisions between human spaceflight, of course I would say that as a former astronaut, human spaceflight and science as an accounting trick. You know, basically, you know, in order to get funded in the federal government, you, know, you have to have lines of business, essentially. And so we have a human spaceflight and exploration uh, line of business. We have a science line of business, technology and aeronautics. But in order, for instance, to land uh, Curiosity on Mars, we had a high uh, technology and aeronautics component. You know, we were doing hypersonic aeronautics into the Martian atmosphere. We leveraged you know, years of NASA research in hypersonics and materials, guidance, navigation, and control. We used elements of human spaceflight. Uh, and so, you know, we're starting to blur those lines more, and I think that's very appropriate. Um, and so, as we go forward, I think you're going to see not necessarily the balance of funding change, because that's a much higher level than, than I control, but more participation, more finding more synergy uh, between the groups. Why? Because I think we really are going to send humans to the Earth orbit. We're going to send humans to Mars. And I look forward to the first women and men set foot on Mars, and you know, my goal is that when we do send uh, people to Mars, that they're scientists, you know, that they're going to explore, they're going to discover. You just said, if you were the one controlling NASA and didn't have to worry quite as much about a budget with Congress, what would be your top priority for the agency? I don't know. That, that question is only going to be in trouble. <laughs> uh, no, I, I, think it's, I think it's to advance uh, you know, to, to field a, uh, you know, a human spaceflight system you know, that is uh, allowing us to you know, go out beyond low Earth orbit, uh, you know, to leave those things that are commercially viable to the commercial sector, and to try and get humans, you know, this is sort of a near-term view, but uh, to get you know, humans to be able to explore you know, the moon and Mars and set up for you know, future you know, centuries when humans you know, may be able to go beyond. Uh, and as part of that, though, uh, to really, just this is my personal interest, so if, if I were you know, the philosopher king, um, I'm really driven by this question of are we alone in the universe? You know, I think we are on the cusp of being able to answer that question, either in our own solar system or you know, in uh, nearby exoplanets. Um, the results from Kepler uh, satellite, looking at this rather distant region, you know, uh, suggest, I'm using you know, weak words, suggest that when you go out, uh, you know, and San Francisco the other night was, was pretty clear when I came in, uh, and you look at the night sky, you can see hundreds of stars. Kepler results suggest that there's a solar system around every one of those stars. Now, there are a few exceptions. But for the most part, that's a fair statement. And if there's a solar system around every one of those stars, that means you know there's probably, if you look up at the night sky, 10 Earth-sized planets that you're looking at. Now, you can't resolve them. Um, and that doesn't mean they're inhabitable zones. We don't know the answer to that question. But I think in a, in a matter of a decade or two, uh, we'll have an answer to that question. And with a moderately large space telescope, we could actually answer the question by looking at the atmosphere of a planet around a nearby star in a habitable zone, whether anybody's home. You know, if they're, you know, producing non-equilibrium conditions on that planet. But we would certainly know continents and oceans, clouds, uh, diurnal, seasonal effects. You know, we could do that with a moderately large 20-meter telescope around Earth. And I think if we look out, you know, 20 or 30 years, that's well within our capability. So I'd want us to get to that capability. And to do that, uh, you know, we need human and robotic capabilities beyond what we have today. But we're setting up for that. You know, the space launch system, uh, the multipurpose crew vehicle, you know, the other investments we're making, the International Space Station to learn how humans uh, can live and operate in space, all of those are important components. And of course, you know, our Mars exploration rovers and our planetary probes, uh, future telescopes, you know, Hubble, Spitzer, they're still doing great work. Good question for you. As a science, uh, uh, scientist and uh, um, at, former astronaut, astronaut. Uh, 
how important do you feel it is for humans to actually land on Mars? I mean, you can do a lot with telerobotics. We're learning the power of robotics out of Mars, you're obviously some of the Mer rovers, et cetera. I mean, could, do we actually need to put boots on the ground? Is that a, do you feel that's an important goal for us? So ignoring the planetary protection issues of us contaminating Mars or the back propagation, if there's life on Mars that we bring it back to Earth and it's an Andromeda strain, um, which is very unlikely. I think the most hazardous planet in the solar system for people is Earth, by far. Um, you know, I'm, I, you know, I've got an alien species inside of me right now making my head congested. You know, hopefully it won't live. <laughs> anyway, you never know. Uh, so, um, it's a frightening planet we live on. But, you know, we don't know about Mars. It's a big question. I mean, you know, it'd be a real shame to go out for science exploration and bring something back that kills us all. So we don't want to do that. But very unlikely. Um, putting people on the surface though, is, I think, uh, would be hugely valuable for science. And it's the pace of science, but it's also human nature. Uh, you know, I think we are destined to go out and explore the planets and eventually the stars. Um, and I, you know, I know that's a really long-term vision, but so far with Curiosity, our most capable rover, 2012, you know, in months we've gone 500 meters. John Grotzner would already have been to all the interesting spots in the spacesuit in the first week uh, and skipped all these boring things. He'd go, wow, this is great. And because of his knowledge of uh, terrestrial geology and planetary geology, you know, he'd be scampering around uh, and, and traveling these great distances. And so it um, you know, really makes a difference. And it's not that it would, he would be alone. He would have robotic tools. You know, there'd probably be a little you know, robot dog geologist following him. To help him out, he would have, you know, great and enhanced uh, perception, you know, just with his, you know, multi hyperspectral cameras on his helmet to give him context. Um, but there's something about, you know, you know, the pace of discovery that does matter. And so, actually, uh, a few years ago, I did a study with um, some others at NASA and uh, an outside organization. The name escapes me. Um, to try and get at this question, and it was. You know, very superficial study of, well, how much science do you get per dollar with robotics and humans? Right? And it's an unfair question because it's always a human robotic partnership. But uh, when we got to the end, you know, roughly speaking, the cost is about the same. You know, it may take, be a hundred times more, two hundred times more costly to get humans to the surface of Mars than it is to get a rover to the surface. So in Canonical units of a billion dollars, which is a big number. You know, a billion dollars to get a rover on the surface, and maybe 100 or 200 to get a human. But the human does more than 100 or 200 times the science per unit time. And so, you know, the question is, do we want to do that? Is that an investment we want to spend? Because the absolute value, the magnitude of 200 billion, is still huge. But if you think of that 200 billion spread out over 15 or 20 years, you know, that fits within NASA's budget. So that is something I think we should aspire to. Um, how has the uh, budget negotiations been going with the administration so far this year in the light of all the potential pitfalls of next year's budget, uh, not having a 2013 budget, and then just kind of going beyond that, what can we do to help make sure that NASA gets the budget it needs to do the kind of exploration science and development? So the question is about the, really the status of the budget and the sausage making. So it really is amazing that we all can continue to function in the federal government where uh, you know, the president submitted his fiscal year 13 budget to the Congress. Of course, it was an election year, so that disturbed things a little bit. And we get to October 1 and we don't have a budget, so we're in a continuing resolution. That just means that Congress has agreed to continue to fund the federal government, um, but we can't make any kind of big changes in the meantime. And we can't guess what the Congress will eventually approve for a budget or when they'll approve it. And so we have to spend at a rate uh, that's consistent with guidelines from Congress. Um, but we have the priorities set by the administration. So we're in this sort of catch-22 position. Uh, and, and then in the fall, we also submitted an FY14 budget. And so that's being worked now through the administration. And my guess is that, uh, and then we have the sequestration and all these other things added to it. Uh, so, you know, if I were in the Office of Management budget now, I'd feel very uncomfortable trying to come up with an FY14 budget until we know what's going to happen with the 
13 and the sequestration and all the rest. So this is a very difficult time, a very difficult time to plan future investments. You know, as far as what, uh, what you can do, uh, you know, I, I'm not allowed to advocate for you know, any different budgets than what the President uh, allocates for us. But I think what's important is that, that we use science for the public good. That's kind of the whole point. And so one of the things that I think the social networking aspect of, uh, of covering science and being scientist uh, is really helpful is you know, to, to reach a broader audience. There's, the more we become insular and you know, love our science, but we don't share it, and share it with future decision makers. So that means you know, a lot of kids uh, and current decision makers. That means like parents who also happen to be taxpayers. You know, we should try and communicate our science because the science is exciting. And sometimes the science, the science is exciting but scary. Uh, and I think that's the case for a lot of climate science. Uh, but it's even more important than to, to be able to communicate that and let people make their own decisions and inform them. But, you know, science for the public good. But also to talk about great things like what we're learning on Mars uh, and, and how that's inspirational. So I would encourage all of you to, to, to use all these great tools to reach as many people as possible. So, uh, this is a personal question. Uh, what do you, not personal, personal, but, you know, your personal feelings on, what do you think when we found water ice on Earth right now, I think it's so, it's just so revolutionary, I think it's a New York Times. Um, Hold on, let me check. <laughs> what do you, uh, do you feel that there is life, how common do you life is our own? You're, you're just guess, yeah. so, so first of all, we found hydrogen on uh, mercury, which we infer is water. Uh, so actually, I'm, I'm not, uh, I'm still open-minded about whether we're, you know, what we're seeing on the poles of mercury uh, in the moon. Uh, it's very ambiguous. We, we still don't have in situ measurements to confirm uh, these things. The place that we do know there's water is Mars sent Phoenix to dig and see if we could find any indications of water. Of course, we were near the poles. And, and uh, sure enough, we land on a, you know, on a glacier. I think that's pretty cool. Um, you know, Mars has an extraordinary amount of water. And in fact, with the SAM results, we're seeing water vapor, which means you could condense the water and drink it if you want to. Uh, there's not much. It's pretty dry on Mars. Um, but we know that water is pervasive throughout the universe. And we see it in molecular clouds. We see it in comets. We see it in the solar system. So it's, it, it's entirely reasonable that there could be uh, water embedded in soils and permanently shattered craters, even in Mercury, so close to the sun that we you know, think of as just this boiling hot planet. Uh, but getting to the life question, this is, you know, this is a fundamental science question that we have the potential to answer. Uh, and you know, I think it, it's, you know, given the Copernican revolution aspect of it, I think it's almost inconceivable that we would be the only life in the universe. The fact that we're here even to ask that question. And the fact that we see places that have water, carbon, and sources of energy, you know, throughout the solar system, throughout the galaxy, and by inference throughout the cosmos. Now, if there's life, if, you know, there's only one you know, source of life in each galaxy, it's not that interesting. And I think what's interesting is how about in our own solar system? How about in nearby stars? Is there anybody we can go visit? Things like that. You know, that's a much more interesting question. Place like Europa or Titan, right? Or yep. Yeah, or Enceladus. Could be anywhere. Do you miss doing research? Do you miss actually sort of being. Yeah, I miss hardware. I miss research. <laughs> uh, you know, I was walking by. So, I mean, this is how perverse I am. I'm walking by the sessions here that are doing, you know, statistical data analysis, thinking I miss doing, you know, inference and data analysis. Yeah, I, I definitely do. And then, so, but in connection, what do you I, like? I have what do you two, like? Or what are your favorite? I have two things? teenage kids, and they do lots of science fair projects. That maybe I have some involved. <laughs> <laughs> uh, what are your favorite parts of the job that you're in now? Uh, science results and well, launches, launches, landings, science results. <laughs> Talking to kids. I have a question. Sure. Um, you mentioned before that you know commercial. You want to leave certain things to commercial space enterprise now. How has you know the rise of commercial space changed NASA's mission, or how do you feel like you're competing with them or working with them, and what's the interplay like there? Well, you know, honestly, we're we're not quite to commercial space flight yet. You know, we've had the first SpaceX launches where we've paid them to deliver cargo and were successful. I think that's great. You know, but we're still heavily subsidized. 
And what we're doing is we're investing in an industry that in the future will offload, you know, routine things. Uh, you know, if, if I'm in my office and I need to get a letter across the country, you know, I don't put it in a, you know, government you know, airplane that we design, build, and operate. You know, I put it in a box that says FedEx or UPS, and boom, you know, there it is. And so you know, we have the opportunity to move to a regime uh, where when NASA needs to get something to LEO, as we're doing today with SpaceX, hopefully we'll do that with Orbital soon, uh, you know, we give them the gear, it arrives on the space station. Uh, that take, that would t will take a big burden off of NASA. Uh, and at the moment, uh, that will be the only way we can get cargo to station, uh, but more importantly, cargo down, experiment data down, blood samples, urine samples, important things like urine samples down. Uh, <laughs> so, uh, and experiments down, things that don't work, bring them down, figure out why they don't work, fix them, get them back up, that kind of thing. You know, that, that uh, having to support that role is a, is a huge overhead. And then in, in subsidizing those groups, those companies to build things, if they can be profitable, you know, then they can turn some of their profits into future vehicles uh, and into future capabilities and serving, you know, whatever customer base there is, tourism, you know, other, other users. You know, Bigelow wants to build a space station, but he doesn't want to build a transportation system, so he wants us to be successful at crew. Crew transport, so we can leverage off of that. And if, if the companies are successful in commercial crew, and there's other customers, then that brings down our marginal cost of sending scientists to orbit, which is a big goal of mine is to get scientists in orbit. So, scientists and engineers. I'm actually pretty even on that. Now, there's another there's another benefit for science directly, uh, which includes both commercial spaceflight and uh, and the space launch system is. One of the big uh, inflationary issues that I have to deal with is pain for rockets, pain for ELVs. When the launch rate is down, that drives the cost up. Uh, the Falcon 9 is, for instance, fits a very nice spot uh, that used to be taken care of by a rocket called the Delta II. And so if we can launch our missions at a lower cost, we can launch more missions and then do more science. And so that's another exciting aspect. And then the space launch system is so powerful that if we want to go to Europa and look for life, or if we want to go uh, you know, explore you know, Mars in more detail or any of these other deep space destinations, uh, SLS offers us an opportunity uh, to have more capability and potentially lower cost than we could do with, and, and the time value as well. You know, if we want to send something to Jupiter, you know, we do multiple flybys of the Earth and the Moon and try and you know, then coast out for seven or eight years. And with SLS, we have the capability to send things on a direct trajectory that significantly shortens the, the duration of getting somewhere. Yep. What do you see about international cooperation? I know that we're very cooperative with the Europeans and, and the Russians, but the Chinese and, and the Indians both seem to be really into it and seem to be going their own way. Do you think that there's an opportunity there that we that we could be missing or that we may be able to, to use their Maybe, maybe we will send an American astronaut to the moon on a on a on a Chinese craft. Yeah, the uh, you know, eighty-five percent or so of our science missions are collaborative with partners all around the world. Uh, you know, the human spaceflight program. We have our you know our main partners, uh, and I think that's been one of the great successes of the International Space Station. Has been that we really work as partners. So that you know, in the loss of Columbia, you know, we were in a really tough place. The Russians said, hey, don't worry, we'll take care of you. Uh, you know, really showed the strength of that partnership. That was a very dicey time, I think, in the uh, International Space Station. And it's not like their you know, space program is heavily funded. You know, they always struggle. They've, they've been a great partner. The Europeans have been a very strong partner with us. Uh, the Canadians and the Japanese, we have a lot of new entrants. You know, we do have a lot of cooperative work with India. You know, China is an exception, and uh, you know we're currently prohibited from working with China on space projects. It's not clear how that's going to turn out. Mm -hmm. You know, I think if we look forward uh, you know, some number of decades, you know, imagine a world where uh, you know we do have human crews going to Mars, and those human crews represent you know, you know over over time because you know, maybe you can send six people, but over. over period of time represent all of our partners. You know, and one country is left out. How's that going to make that country feel? I mean, that is of such significance. I think that would almost be enough 
uh, to change the world politic. You know, if, if a country felt like their behavior in the planet was affecting their ability to be part of this major expansion of, of humans into the cosmos, I think that would be very powerful. You mentioned earlier uh, using the Falcon 9 as a potential lower cost uh, launch vehicle. Are there any planet missions that are going to use the Falcon 9 yet, or is that still kind of... Yeah, actually, we've selected a few. In fact, just last week, I think uh, the Air Force selected the Falcon 9 for the Discover mission, uh, which is going to Earth Sun L1. And it has some uh, space weather payloads and then also a couple of Earth science payloads. That's the, that was originally Triana sometimes called GORSAP. Yeah, that'll launch in 2014 on Falcon 9. Yeah, John, you have this unique perspective of being an astronaut and a scientist. What, how closely now are things progressing toward uh, this merger of the two worlds now more than ever, do you think? And how closely do you want to build your survivor kind of part of the space space like, as opposed to what we were 10, 5 years ago? Are we, merged, are we going more in that direction now? There's no question we are. You know, there, you often hear of stovepipes and things. And, you know, Bill Gerstermeyer, myself, Mike Kazarek, Mason Peck, we're trying to break down the barriers between all the organizations of NASA. And it's not, it's not just because, you know, the, in, in, you know, in uh, the budgets that without inflation, you know, a flat budget, you know, we're, we're able to do less and less, so we're trying to find things where it's synergistic. We should always have been doing that. But it's also just because it, it makes a lot of sense. On the International Space Station, the science mission director is providing a lot of payloads. Uh, and so that's a, a very big cooperative area, both in Earth science and space science. Uh, you know, we're putting observatories and, and equipment on the International Space Station. Some are up there now, some are planned in the very near future, and some are a little bit further out. Um, so we're using the ISS, International Space Station, as a platform uh, to do science that you know, gives us access to getting instruments up much sooner than we could, and maybe a little bit more experimental, risky uh, techniques and tools so that we can prove them to put them on other platforms. Uh, human spaceflight is putting more equipment on our missions. Curiosity has a number of human spaceflight experiments that, you know, if it was pure science, might not have been competitive, but we've made accommodations because it will answer, it answers, like the RAD experiment, answers fundamental questions about the radiation environment in crews and on the surface uh, that's of scientific interest but is also required information uh, before we send humans. Uh, in fact, I was very encouraged by the RAD results yesterday that show that uh, the radiation exposure of a, a long round trip mission to Mars is not much different uh, than a, an ISS mission. There may be a factor of two greater radiation, but you know, I would consider of the overall risks of a mission, I think the radiation risk then is relatively minor. And it's a risk that when you come back to Earth, that you die earlier than you would have due to an increased risk of cancer. And uh, you know, I know if I was given the choice, you know, let's see, you can go to Mars and explore Mars and come back and you have a you know, 5% risk of dying in the rest of your natural lifetime instead of a 3% risk. I'd say that's a pretty acceptable risk. Given that you know the chance of blowing up on the launch pad or burning up in the Martian atmosphere or dying in the vacuum of space are all about that size or greater. Uh, you know that's a small risk to take in comparison. Remind me, was it you or Drew Voicel that last touched on? That would be one. <laughs> they asked you again. But I was wearing a glove, so does that count? Yes. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. If you, if, if they said, let's say we want to do another SM5, would you volunteer? Well, I'd certainly volunteer. I'd also volunteer Drew. Drew was <laughs> just a great space walker, NGU member, geologist. Uh, great guy. So NASA, uh, in conjunction with the work you guys, announced the two astronauts we're going to spend a year on the ISS. So that's one thing we're doing to, to go forward and to try to get the Mars. What else is NASA doing to, you know, be, there's some radiation studies, but. Is there a program for getting people to Mars with all the different things that would be involved in You know, that? it's not as well coordinated as I would like uh, to see, but that's really in Bill Gerstermeyer's world. We talk about it a lot. Um, as you may have already noticed, I have a lot of opinions on things. Mm -hmm. Most of them are, are data-based. Uh, you know, but you're an astronaut, when my daughter so you asks, know more yeah. than we do what would yeah. be involved in that. When my daughter says she wants to go to the mall on a Saturday night, I ask her for data. How are you going to get there? How are you going to be there? Do you have money? What are you going for? You know, 
What, what, what do you consider your minimum success criteria? You know, what are you not doing because you're going to the mall? Drives them crazy, but uh, I'm a very data-driven person. Uh, help, help them with their decision. Uh, we'll see how long that lasts. <laughs> but, uh, but as far as, as what we're doing on the International Space Station, there are a number of things. You know, and, and we're you know, reprocessing you know, urine to turn into drinking water, the close life support system. You know, uh, CO2 system, so that's sort of the engineering. In the human spaceflight part, you know, the human body cannot discern the difference between six months on the International Space Station and six months cruise to Mars, other than radiation. You know, from a free fall point of view, it, it's all the same. And so really the critical function of the human body to get you to Mars, health, health is a big factor. And uh, you know, something that you know, I was promoting years ago has now actually been proven, uh, that the, the solution to uh, bone loss, Space flight induced bone loss, muscle atrophy, cardiovascular tone, many of the things in the immune system uh, that seem to be a major factor in these long duration flights can be solved by two simple uh, prescriptions. And uh, it, you know, it shouldn't surprise anyone. And I don't know why it took us so long to get there, um, but it's diet and exercise. And so now we have data to prove that. And what that means is, with proper nutrition and proper resistive exercise, you know, we can do the six month cruise to Mars and have, you know, essentially little del deleterious effects from the cruise other than the radiation problem. Yeah, so that's, that's going to be some shielding and other things. But what about laundry? I didn't hear that was an issue. Uh, you know, there's a whole bunch of, there's a, seriously, food and laundry and, and habitability and things, I think is a complete red herring. Uh, and, and this is a good venue to talk about that because, uh, you know, on the shuttle you got to change your clothes every day. Okay, when I go to Alaska for a month, and I'm in the wilderness, you know, I'm kind of a I splurge. I bring two changes. I bring the clothes I'm wearing and one other change. And that's really in case something happens, like, you know, the long underwear gets, gets ripped or, you know, who knows. Uh, but uh, you know, the, the nature of real exploring, you know, is um, high tolerance for adversity. And in fact, you know, clothes is never an issue. You know, and that's, you know, in a tent, you know, with the same person, you know, day after day for a month. Um, you know, people do, you know, much longer field. Uh, research and you know you support it the way you can. I think all of those things go away when you have a high performance challenge. If you knew you were going to Mars, uh, you would easily, you'd, first of all, you'd select people who don't have to have clean clothes every day. And, and second of all, you'd, uh, you know, you'd have you know, people who would be willing to change their behavior for such a, a spectacular goal. And the same is true for food and, and space and everything else. Very, you know, it's basically, if you want to climb Mount Everest, like Mallory and Irving, uh, or the South Pole, like Scott, you get what you deserve. You, know, you try and take, you know, a cabin with you, you know, you try and set up, you know, afternoon tea on the Kumbu Glacier, you know, and, and have all the comforts of home, and you're very unlikely to succeed. You know, you go the way that, um, you know, people do today. You know, it's very light, you know, express, high tech, uh, you know, low risk, but, uh, you know, lightweight, and people climb solo now, and very successful. And, and we have to take that, that modern approach. Not, uh, e you know, even uh, Hillary and Norgay you know, had a massive support team. Now, we have that support team on Earth, but what you send to Mars, you know, I think it's got to be the minimum that you need to get the job done. And that's due to new, I think it's MA. The mass, if you want a big A, you need a small M. Forgive it for us. But it's really about how, how we do exploration success. You know, if, you, if you pay too much attention to creature comforts, you'll never go. How many of you have ever done field work? So is it always comfy? Anybody been to the pole mm -hmm. or done the Antarctica? I mean, you want to worry about frostbite and important things, but not how comfortable it is. It's my opinion. But can you get, so politically, like, do you think that can, we can let astronauts go without the creature comfort? I think we won't go until we give those things up. Yeah. I've, I've advocated that for years. I mean, that's why we end up with these massive missions that can never go anywhere. Small is beautiful. Light is beautiful, actually. I don't care about size. Light. Light is important. Every, every ounce should count. And that's how we got to the moon. You know, we couldn't, we couldn't land uh, until we got the uh, lunar module down in mass. People often wonder, well, could we have landed earlier? Well, yeah, we could have landed, but it was too heavy to get off. And I would 
been stuck on the moon. Uh, so there's just a huge weight loss effort on the planet. So much so that, as you've heard, the walls of the lunar module are like thick aluminum foil. And you stick a pen to it. Um, a lot of kind of going on what you just said there, uh, there's been people kind of saying over the years that NASA has become too risk averse. And I was curious about your perspective as an astronaut to that concept because you're at the most risk. Do you think NASA is too risk averse or do you think astronauts um, can or desire to take on more risk or is it just kind of a how the risk of flying? I, th I think most, most people in the general public have no good uh, qualitative and certainly no quantitative feel for risk. You know, just look at the way people drive. I, I have to commute. The, the worst part of my, you asked me the best part of my job. The worst part of my job is my commute. I spend uh, at least an hour and 40 minutes round trip, sometimes three hours on the Washington, Baltimore roads. And it's, it's absolutely the worst part of the job. And you know, certainly every week, sometimes every day, I see an accident, you know, either on the side of the road or in real time, and it's almost all due to, uh, to risky behavior. You know, speeding, almost all of them are speed related, and you know, it doesn't make any sense because you know, you know you're always going to end up going you know, five miles an hour at some point in the near future. Uh, and so there's no point in going to 80 in a 55 zone knowing that you know, me and my little putt-putt Toyota, I'm going to end up right next to you in five minutes, mm -hmm. you know, within a car or two. Uh, you know, I just see horrible accidents, and, and people think that's not risky. They say, ah, I'm just driving, you know, a few miles over doesn't matter, but it significantly increases your risk. Um, so, you know, when folks criticize NASA or, or whatever for not being you know, risk averse, we actually do quantitative risk assessment and then come up with you know, pretty good ways of numerically you know, assessing the risk of various things. Um, you know, if you sit on four and a half million pounds of explosive fuel, you know, that's pretty risky. So on my last trip, you know, the, the quantitative estimate was that I had a 1 in 67 chance of not coming back. And so the question is, you know, how is that really risky? You know, I thought that was pretty risky, but I did feel like for Hubble it was worth taking that risk. Um, also, I had the benefit, for first-time flyers, you know, that's a different discussion. But that was actually the safest space shuttle I ever flew on, because we made all the improvements since Columbia, and many other improvements as in a, in a quest to get safer. Going to space station, it's a little bit safer. You know, we've now retired the shuttle. Why did we retire the shuttle? Because collectively, we actually felt that that was too much risk for something that we wanted to do routinely for the return of getting cargo and people to and from space. You know, the hope with uh, something like a SpaceX, you know, or a uh, CT-100 from Boeing, or you know, these other commercial vehicles, is that by being simpler, they can go a factor of ten greater in safety uh, for this transportation. Work. So maybe we get to you know, something like one in a thousand, that's still reasonably risky. So, when we go to Mars, we're going to have to accept a lot more risk. The, the astronauts for the moon felt like they were in a 50-50 category. We got everybody there and everybody back. You know, the only time we lost a crew was on the ground in a fire. And it was, you know, again, because people were, were not paying attention. So. What do you think about the, the idea of of a one-way, a, a mission that would basically set up a colony and that, and basically would be one way. I think that's so far off to be able to support that. Uh, you know, you don't want to send people one way knowing they're only, only going to make it six months. And that yeah, well, that, that. Americans yeah, don't do exactly, that. Exactly, exactly. Uh, no, so, you know, there's a potential to wait on, but, you know, what happens when the colony starts falling apart? You know, some critical light support element doesn't work or, you know, something happens. You know, so, I, I think the early missions are going to be more like, you know, traditional exploration where we send people to explore they come back and, and each time we go we build upon that. So, last one, Stephanie. Yeah. So so in terms of Mars, have you thought about sending things ahead? You know, so that you have supplies and equipment yeah. there before your before your um, astronauts land there? Yeah, I, th I think uh, even though it's expensive, I think that's has such huge benefits that mm -hmm. and this is the Zubrin Mars direct concept. It, you know, you send your infrastructure ahead first, you know, and we're kind of doing that now. We're exploring with these ever more capable robots. Um, but you would send infrastructure there, and then you would bring infrastructure with you that matches that. Uh, and so in theory, and this is, I'm a big advocate of in-situ resource utilization, use what you have available on the surface. Uh, 
So when you go and live on a glacier, you melt the glacier to drink. You, know, you don't carry water with you, you bring fuel. But if we can make a lot of materials on Mars, and there's plenty of water on Mars that we can use, uh, if we can make rocket fuel, you, know, you, you wouldn't necessarily do your Mars injection burn from Earth until you already had a rocket set up for your return trip, just in case. And if you, if you, you know, successfully land, now you have two, so you've set up for the next crew, and you return in one of them. I, I think that's a good strategy, good logistics strategy. So, alrighty, I think I'm running out of time.